What's up, Joe? Hello, world. Joe, you and I are recording this on Labor Day. We are we are doing labor on Labor Day. We are laboring. Isn't that what the name of the... We're laboring. We're laboring on the day. We're, this is how we recognize it. It's what the holiday is all about. You labor on Labor Day. Exactly. Exactly. Speaking of labor, one of the questions that we're going to answer is from a woman whose spouse has is trying to decide between a corporate job versus a small business route. And there's, there's, you know, how do you make an apples to apples comparison? We're going to tackle that. We're also foreshadowing. We're also going to answer a question from an engineer who has paid off her student loans. She drives trains. uh, No, I believe uh, that's a train conductor. (laughs) Sorry. I didn't mean to derail you. I was just wondering about her job. You know what? With that, let's uh, let's just cut to the first question. Let's just let's, let's stop while we're ahead. So here's our first question, and it comes from uh, she goes on Zoom. She goes by I am not a werewolf, but uh, in reality, she goes by Christina. Christina. Hi, Paula and Joe. My name's Christina. I continue to love the podcast and was actually a student in the last income property course. It was great. I highly recommend it. Anyway, my question is a general one. Recently, I've been hearing some questions on the podcast and listening to the financial situations people find themselves in. Many people sound like superstars, high earners and high and or growing net worth. I'm mid journey And I'm starting to feel a a bit like I'm in my groove, but the groove is getting boring. (laughs) I'm following the plan, made the large leaps in paying off debt early, which felt exhilarating. Now I'm in the auto invest and collecting money for a down payment for a rental property. What suggestions do you have to help stay the course during the less exciting parts of the journey? Thanks. Christina, that is a wonderful question. Uh, in fact, Joe and I were talking before we started recording. We were like, we want to lead with this question because it's it's one that I think a lot of people experience, but very few talk about. There's the ennui of being in the that muddled middle. And when I think of the term muddled middle, um, there's a podcast episode that we did with a guy by the name of Daniel Pink, um, who wrote a book called When, The Scientific Secrets of Perfect Timing. What he talks about is that generally enthusiasm for anything is highest at the beginning and at the end, but then there's always a muddled middle. And you take this and you can apply it to literally a day in your life. Most people typically, there are a few, you know, there's about 20% are exceptions, but Roughly 80% of the population has a very high energy first thing in the morning when when we're fresh. Mid-afternoon, most people have a slump. And then in the evening, energy actually picks back up again. So uh, that's the rhythm of a day. Similarly, if you look at happiness across a person's lifetime, the statistically speaking, the time in which you are most likely to be unhappy is around your 50s. Uh, and that's because it's that muddled middle where you've lost the the enthusiasm of your teens, your 20s, your 30s, but you haven't yet found the uh, the peace and wisdom and perspective that comes when you're in your 80s. So in, it's that the 40s and 50s where you're just in that muddled middle. And um, according to Daniel Pink in this book, When, and he talks about this in the interview that we did, it's in your 40s and fi- late 40s, typically early 50s, uh, that you are, statistically speaking, most likely to be kind of feeling a little bit of a slump. What you're describing right now is the muddled middle of a journey towards a major financial goal. And I'm assuming for you, that's financial independence, which for people who are new to this podcast, that is having enough money such that uh, work becomes optional. You know, having enough money such that you know that no matter what, you'll be okay. That is that is a multi-decade journey. The only way to get out of the muddled middle is by breaking it into smaller goals and smaller constituent components such that you're not even thinking of the 20-year journey. You're thinking about 
some really cool one year or two year or maybe even six month goal that's immediately ahead of you? When we build financial plans, Paula, we do exactly that because you know, the average financial plan we built, somebody would need a multiple of millions of dollars to get where they wanted to go, you know, maybe two, three, $4 million. And Hey, if you're 28 years old and you've saved $80,000, You've, you've done a decent job. You've done a really good job, but you're like, I am so screwed. I've got so far to go. And, you know, you can run these games like the rule of 72, but much better than that is to build. Where do I need to be? Don't even look at that long-term thing. Look at just where do I need to be six months from now and work off that because those, those quicker goals keep you in the game and, and they keep you in the game one of two ways. Number one is if you're behind at a six month number, you're going to be behind by little enough that by increasing your saving, you can make up the difference. And I found often that if, you know, if the market didn't do what it was supposed to do or life hit and some unnecessary, not unnecessary, some, some necessary expenses hit that, that veered you off course, you can take corrective action and that keeps your head in the game, right? Mm -hmm. Which has huge effects long-term even though it feels like I'm just taking these little tiny corrections short term. The second one is too many of us wait until late, late in life to do the fun stuff. And if we're ahead, we can also make the decision. I'm going to play a little more right now. I'm going to enjoy where I am because I'm ahead on this long-term goal. So I love everything about creating those milestones. Right. I think there's something else going on here though, Paula. Mm, what's that? You know, when Christina began, she was talking about, hey, I'm hearing, uh, you know, these rock stars, these high income earners, comparing your goal to somebody else will always, always create frustration and boredom. And I'm not going fast enough, itis. Right. Yeah, that comparison is the thief of joy. It is absolutely. So I think that that creates the muddled middle for a lot of people, you know, give yourself some grace. Don't compare yourself to other people. You'll get there. It, yeah. it is. Uh, it's so fun to run your own journey and it's not fun to run somebody else's journey. Yeah. You know, one thing that I like to do sometimes when I'm setting goals is rather than set a goal that pertains to a result, I will set a goal that pertains to effort. So for example, um, when I was, uh, when I was in grad school, I gained the freshman 15 times two, right? I, I gained the master's 30. Um, so I put on 30 pounds in the last year. If I think about that as a, as a just get back to where I was on orientation day, if I think about that as a goal, uh, it feels like I'm going backwards. And so it's not motivating. Um, but instead, what I've done is I've reframed it. I'm like, you know what? My goal isn't even the result. My goal is these are the number of hours per week that I want to be in the gym, right? And that's, that's the goal that I have. And so every week it's, did I put that number of hours into the gym this week? And that's it. That is the only goal that I have. And if I happen to have any physical benefits from that, that's great. But the goal is... Did I put in X number of hours? Yes or no? That's interesting. Mm -hmm. I, uh, uh, I have found that, you know, uh, getting up early and doing the workout has become just increasingly annoying and difficult for me <laughs> over the last few months. Mm -hmm. But what I also found just in the last few weeks is if instead of being frustrated by the gym or the run or whatever it might be, if I realize that that is my time and I'm out there, Paula, because I enjoy that time, that's my own time and I find the joy in it, it's so much better. And the last, just literally the last two weeks, what you're saying hit home because my only goal is to be there and find what I like about it. And I found yesterday I did this, uh, I did this four mile run and I love the whole thing. It was super fun. And because I loved it, by the way, it was easier I was sad when I got done with it, which is weird because usually I'm halfway done. I'm like, can I get the hell out of here? <laughs> but instead I embrace it's It's like being in the moment, you know, mm -hmm. being b b 
realizing that it's not about this long-term thing. It's about enjoying where I'm at now in the process, right? And uh, I mean, this is the case that we see all the time with retirement. If we want to take these little examples you and I are making and, and push them out to some of these huge goals, so many people get to retirement and then 18 months later, they're completely disillusioned. Right. And the reason they're disillusioned is because they feel like that finish line is when I'm finally going to be happy. Well, we know that that is not the case. You need to be happy with the journey. You got to be happy with where you are now. So, right. so I love this idea of, hey, instead of, instead of this being the muddled middle, this is the cool right now. And what am I doing to make this process as enjoyable as it can possibly be? Right, right. I just did an interview uh, for a news article. Somebody, uh, there was a reporter who was writing an article about saving for a big bucket list trip, right? And one of the things that I uh, said to the interviewer was, hey, you know, part of my advice is don't put too much stock into that big bucket list trip because if you spend five years saving for this really big, amazing trip, you've put so much expectation on that trip that there's going to be a gap between expectation and reality. And the, that gap between expectation and reality is where disappointment lives. It's fine to like enjoy the fun of planning for a trip, but it crosses into problematic or you know likely to cause disappointment when it becomes the expectation of the trip is the holy grail. Yeah. And the, the same is true in finance. One of the things that you can do with a big long-term financial goal, uh, such as financial independence, and, and this is part of the reason, one of the many, many reasons why I am much more a fan of the earn more side of the equation than the frugal down side of the equation is if, if what you're doing on this journey is, um, feels like deprivation, well, of course it's going to suck, right? But if instead, it's okay, think about Homer Simpson. You know how Homer Simpson on The Simpsons, um, you know how like every other episode, he always has some crackpot, harebrained money-making scheme, right? He's like Mr. Plow, the snowplow guy. He starts a, a bar that rivals Moe's. He, like, like, you actually, you can go online and look at this, like, complete list of all of Homer Simpson's various side hustles, all of his various jobs, right? He never quits the nuclear power plant. He's always working for Mr. Burns. But he has, like, 400 different side hustles, and what he's doing fundamentally is he's finding fun, clever, creative ways to make a little bit of extra cash, but he enjoys the game of it. And because each of these are like new adventures, um, there's also that novelty, right? He's not in the muddled middle because it's the beginning of this new kind of cool side hustly thing that he's doing. So, I mean, you can take, you can take Homer Simpson's example and apply that to your own life in terms of like any time that you're trying to make a little bit more money, what are the ways that you can start something new, make it fun, and kind of make it a, a hack or make it an adventure. Make it something that's like, you know, just kind of fun in and of its own sake as a, as a discrete project. And over time, those cumulatively will, will progress you along that journey but each one is its own discrete thing. It, it's its own episode. There's been a lot of science around the uh, role of play in adult life, where as, as we grow up, we forget how to play. And it's really interesting to read some of this research where if we take the, as an example, whatever job you're focused on, and it's a random Saturday, so it's your time. It's not work time, assuming that you don't work on Saturday. If you do work on Saturday, take whatever your day off is and make right. it that day. And instead, you're going to put in a little extra toward that thing, Paula. Mm -hmm. But instead of looking at the entire job, you just take the part that you really like and you just play with it. Just just play with it for, for a while. And all of a sudden it changes the task and makes some of the things that you feared really fun. And you find that when we let ourselves play, we take the pieces of our job that we fear that we don't want to do and we approach them from an angle, like our subconscious brain helps us through it. You know what I mean? It's really, it's really exciting to see um, if you take the Homer Simpson approach and, and you apply it to your own life in a very playful way as this, uh, 
as this way to get over the hump. I just I find the science of play to be very very um, interesting and 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 very cool, especially for people that are feeling a little bit of ennui. And Christina, you yourself have done a really good job of this because there's a, a little success that you've had, which you got clever, you got creative, and you kind of figured out a way to to game the system or hack the system uh, in your favor to accelerate your progress. <clears throat> and the way that you did that, it's clever, it's fun, it's creative. Uh, let's, let's hear you describe it. Hi, Paul and Joe. This is Christina again. I'm submitting a second recording because I did something unique to pay off my student loans a few years back, and it really helped me. For background, I graduated in 2007 with about $60,000 in student loan debt, and at the time it was 7% interest. Yikes, I felt like I was drowning. And I had a solid starting salary as an engineer, but was afraid I was going to have to get a second job. As an aside, I had worked in the financial aid office while I was in college and learned that if I was in college half-time, loans would be deferred. So I calculated the cost to carrying the loan versus the cost of enrolling in community college part-time. I learned it was cheaper to be in school versus trying to pay the loan interest. So I declared a general studies major at a local community college. At the time, I had to declare a major to get the deferral and enrolled in a gym class and a stress management class. I paid heavily on the loans toward the principal while they were deferred. To be clear, this only worked on the federal subsidized portion where the interest doesn't accrue. I also learned that this strategy was more beneficial in the spring term because if I get a deferral in the spring semester, I would carry it through the summer. So basically the cost of two courses for eight months of interest deferred. I paid the principal down heavily until the math no longer made sense, then just made regular payments and paid extra toward the principal. The math stopped working sometime near paying off the federal loans. This also made me think ahead early on when I was considering consolidation. I decided to consolidate the private money for the lower interest rate for as long as possible so I'd have extra cash to really hit the deferred loans first. And I actually kept those separate. So when I paid one off, I would go and snowball into the next one quickly. Not all loans have to be consolidated together. And I think people don't always realize that. Some food for thought is I hear that insanely high student loans people are taking. This might be a good strategy for others. It really, really worked for me. I paid everything off in under five years and saved over $60,000 in interest. Thanks for your time. Looking forward to hearing more about this. Christina, I love that. What a, what an awesome example. And that, to me, it, it's an example that actually helps illustrate the answer to your first question, which is how do you stay motivated? You find really clever, creative ways <laughs> to, to hack the system to your benefit. Right. That's in, in addition to all of the money that it saved you, the 7 percent interest that you were able to uh, defer while you were aggressively paying down the principal. In addition to all of that, it's just kind of fun, you know, like that. That's just kind of a fun way to go about it. I think the thing we need to clarify for for the whole mm -hmm. of afford anything family is that. This only works if the federal student loans are subsidized. Mm -hmm. If they're unsubsidized student loans, they're still going to be, you're still going to have interest accruing during that time. And it's going to be much harder to make up that time. And it probably doesn't work. Yeah. But if, the, if your loans are subsidized, yeah. federal subsidized she, loans, mm -hmm. she subsidizes a lot more time. Yeah. The other she, thing she says to, that in her, uh, in her voicemail, but we just wanted to, also yeah, I just wanted to that. Yeah. emphasize that. Yes, absolutely. Cause somebody's like, Ooh, I should do that too. And you really want to make sure they're subsidized. Second, second thing is, is that you're also realize that what Christine is doing is she's trading one currency for another currency. She's trading time mm -hmm. 
for money. And time is a currency. I think a lot of people, especially in money, our money geek friends, that, that, that we underemphasize mm-hmm. the value of time often um, because, well, for a lot of reasons. But if, if those classes she took, Paula, were classes she really wanted to take yeah. that will make her life brighter, make Christina's ball burn brighter, then heck yeah, yeah. you're trading time for something that you love to do and paying less money at the same time. Exactly. And she took a, a gym class and a stress management class. Those both sound like they're, they're wonderful wellness classes. I would have preferred a wine drinking class. But <laughs> anyway. Well, well m- maybe that's possible for you, Joe. Mm-hmm. Maybe, maybe that's maybe, it. Maybe uh, the next time that you needed to defer your federal subsidized loans, <laughs> you'll go to sommelier school. Delicious. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Christina, for the question. And I hope we've provided some insight into how to, to get through that, that muddled middle. You know, last thing I'll say, I was reading um, earlier today that marathon runners, oftentimes, they just run from, they don't run the entire 26.2 mile marathon. I, I mean, they do, literally. But in their head, they don't. In their head, they're running from this marker to that marker. And then when they, you know, and then they run from that marker to the next marker. And so mentally, they're simply running from marker to marker to marker to marker. Though to the outside world, it looks as though they're running a continuous 26.2 miles. I had a scholarship to run track and cross country in, in college. <laughs> And when I was in high school, my mile times got much better when I separated the mile into four quarters. And I had a a specific time I needed to have for that one quarter. It got even better, though, Paula, when I separated it into eight 220-yard intervals. Mm. When when I, when I did that, the, the more I broke it down and just concentrated on the here, the now, the next 200 yards... I, I did so much better. And then I, you know, got fat and lazy and didn't run for a long time. And then I, now I've run 11 marathons. And even for a slow guy like me, there's this method called the Galloway method where you run and then you walk and then you run and you walk and you don't think about 26.2 for us. We run for seven minutes and then we walk a minute, meaning me and my friends. When we do these marathons, I only think about the next seven minutes. And by the way, I don't even think about how far I'm going to run those seven minutes. Mm. I just concentrate on, I'm going to run for another seven minutes. Then I get a walk break and then I'm going to run for another seven minutes. I get away. It, it made running 26 miles so much easier doing it the way you're talking about mm. than, um, than, than doing it the other way. Right. And, you know, on the, on the subject of the walk breaks, make sure, if, again, if the goal is financial independence if, or retirement or whatever it is, if it's a big long-term financial goal, make sure that you are building in short-term goals and treats along the way. It's, it's kind of akin to what I said about if it's a big bucket list trip, don't put too much emphasis on that trip. Don't put too much expectation on that trip. Uh, instead, enjoy things that you're doing prior to the trip. Same is true with retirement or financial independence. Don't overemphasize that, right? That is, it's not a goal so much as it is a direction, right? If you can reframe it, not as, you know, this is my life prior to achieving it, and then this is my life after. That's the way a lot of people think of it. If instead you can reframe it as, this is just sort of the, a principle or an idea that outlines the direction in which I want to move. And then I live my, and, and then I enjoy every day of my life, regardless of whether I'm there or not. To give it a, a marathon example, the purpose of running a marathon is not to reach the finish line, even though every marathon runner ultimately does want to reach the finish line. The purpose is also to, to enjoy the run itself. Well, what's funny is, is I look back over those marathons and the number of times, the the amount of stuff I remember about the finish line, Mm -hmm. about being there is very little, but the stuff that happened along the journey, I had some hilarious, Mm. we we can, this is a whole different podcast, but some hilarious, some fun, some funny, some stupid stuff that happened along the way. It's the stuff that happened along the way that creates the stories, not the finish line often. Right, exactly. 
the finish line just kind of points you in the general direction. So, all right. Well, so thank you, Christina, for the question. Our next question comes from Mary. Hi, Paula. My husband and I are trying to make a decision about two job opportunities that he has. The first is a corporate position at a well-known company, commuting to the office three days a week, full benefits, a matching 401k, etc. The second is working full-time at a very small but successful company that sells equipment to towns along the East Coast and expanding to the Midwest. The small company is run by a mutual friend of ours who is looking to find a partner to help expand, and he wants to retire in a few years and possibly pass the reins to someone else. My husband is currently working for him while he is in between jobs and has worked in all corporate positions previous to this. The small company is close to our house, a 20-minute drive versus 35-45 minute train ride to the city for the corporate position, but he does go in five days a week. The man he works for at the small company asked my husband, quote unquote, what would it take for my husband to stay and work for him? For years, my husband has talked about working at a small business and has always wanted to run a small business. He's interested in staying at the small business versus going back to corporate. My husband and I are trying to figure out how to come up with a salary number if he was to work at the small company. How do we go about comparing two offers and what what other things besides salary should we be thinking about that he would be getting at a corporate company versus a small? For instance, the small company wouldn't have a matching 401k, which to me feels like losing free money for retirement. But I guess that is something we could compensate for in a total salary package for the small company offer. We are in our mid to late 30s, no kids, but are trying, have a mortgage, no debt. We have a pretty healthy 401k and investment account. From our expenses point of view, I have the amount he would need to make so we can live comfortably and be making our savings goal. We're trying to think of the total package and any benefits we might not have considered. Any advice or questions we should think about are greatly appreciated. I think my husband feels conditioned to take a corporate position, but this opportunity seems like it could be what he's been looking for. Thank you in advance, and we appreciate any advice and help that we can get from you. These, Paul, are some of my favorite questions. Questions like this are my favorite question. Yes. Same. I've, and I've got some, uh, some strong words ho, for ho, ho, ho. my answer. True. It's true. Joe, do you mind if I, do you mind if I roll full it, it is your head? show, Paula. So why don't you roll oh. into it? <laughs> I don't think you have to ask my permission. So, Mary... <clears throat> I'm going to say something intentionally shocking, meant oh, to provoke oh, shock. Oh, do it. Yes, yes. Salaries are for losers. Boom. You heard it here first. All right. What do I, what do I mean by that? Obviously, I'm being tongue in cheek. No, almost nobody gets rich from a salary. And if you're thinking about a salary, uh, you're thinking about being a clock puncher. Salary does not matter. Don't ever do anything for salary. And if you're, if you're, negotiating salary if if like that's where your head is at then you that's that is the mindset of punching the clock um and 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 just and not going very far and this idea uh does not just come from me it also comes from mr jamie Dimon, the ceo of jp morgan chase he talks about this frequently um where he talks about you know if, if any advice that he would give to any young person, including his own kids, is do not ever worry about your salary. Um, you need enough to live, right? You need enough to make sure that you aren't in a bad financial position. You need enough to pay your bills, to keep a roof over your head, to put food on the table, to keep the lights on, to put clothes on your back, blah, 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 right? Once you have that, your salary becomes moot, frankly. It's a moot point. And what matters from that point forward are, is your ability to take part in upside gains. So if there is a profit share or if there is any type of, uh, you said that this guy wants to retire in a few years and he's potentially looking for somebody to pass the reins on to, any type of ownership stake or ownership potential, that's the money. That is the only thing that matters. I would... I mean, frankly, if you can support both of you, and this is extreme, if you can support both of you on your salary, I would go to him and say, tell you what, buddy, give me a salary of $1 per year, but, but give me this incredible profit share or this incredible uh, vested ownership stake. 
I'll work for a dollar a year. I don't need salary, but I want I want Fabulous. the upside. Bam. There, there, we there go. it is, Paula. All right, and it shocks a lot of people, right? Because because we're, we're conditioned to think a salary is how you are compensated. A sal- if you are thinking about salary oh, anywhere above and beyond the amount that you need in order to have a, a you know, pay your bills and put aside some money for retirement or put aside, create a rainy day fund, right? If you're thinking about salary, anything above and beyond what you actually need, then you're thinking small. Sure, which which leads to my much less uh, um, bam point, which is rather than do the difficult math around two things, one of which you want to do and one of which you don't want to do, instead take the one you want to do and see what it takes to make it work. Because life is about doing what you want to do, not about doing what you think you should do. So, so I think if I start from that parameter, it sounds like what they want to do is work for the small company. Yeah, yeah, it's, that was very clear from the way that she asked that question. The only thing you need to know then, to your point earlier, uh, and I won't say this as fluently as Jamie Dimon is, is well, what does it take to put bread on the table? And the one thing I would be clear about here, though, and this is much more tactical, Paul, than what you're talking about, I want to make it clear with that business owner why you are taking this opportunity because you're looking at it as big picture opportunity. But it, and I'll tell you this one personally, you had it. We had an episode, a, a couple episodes ago where you talked very, uh, very openly um, about your divorce and about what you learned from that process. I learned that when I sold my business and I don't talk about this very much. When I sold my business, the guy I sold it to told me that there was an opportunity for me to possibly take over this much bigger firm. I wasn't going into that for, 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 for that reason. I was going into it for a lot of different reasons, but I thought that was the case. But Paula, we never, ever, ever really had a much bigger chat about that. Imagine my surprise though, three months after I join this bigger firm after selling it into that firm that his daughter comes in and I realize very quickly that even though his daughter has absolutely no financial planning experience, no idea what that's going on. The chance of Joe ever running this firm is zero, zero, but that was not what we talked about Mm. over beers while we were discussing me joining this much bigger firm. So, so if you can get that contractually, Mm. that's fantastic. Now you probably won't get it contractually at the beginning because he doesn't know you well enough. You, you haven't worked together enough, but there has to be some sort of a runway for me to get that. And that runway should be a runway that's in writing and very clear that this is what we're headed to. We are headed toward transfer of ownership here. We're headed toward me being the successor I want to get as much of that as I possibly can in stone so that you don't make a mistake. Luckily for me, Paula, I wasn't even really concentrating on that. My goal actually was to sell the firm and get out of financial planning completely and go become a high school teacher and a track coach. I had made enough money and I was, I was ready to enjoy this other thing with, with some time. Um, And obviously that changed. Instead, I made it to afford anything, which was way better than being a teacher and a track coach. But, Um, but had I, had I really been as invested as Mary seems to be in this company, if I've been as invested and that was a big piece of my decision-making, I want to make sure that that's as in writing as I can get it. Right. Exactly. And, and there are a a lot of different ways that you can do this, right? So it might be immediately, you know, it would be uncommon in year one for, uh, an, an owner to start trans, to start of a small company to start giving you a percentage of the company, right? Um, but there could be for if if the owner is interested in transferring the company upon retirement, there could be some type of uh, metric related benchmark where if your husband reaches X Y Z performance metric, right? Um, that might be one, one way to do it for people that know any type of like simple coding, like just if then scenarios, if this happens, then that will happen. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And you can do a bunch of those. And remember there are a couple of you, you could, I, it could either be an ownership conversation or 
It can be a profit share conversation. And those are very much not the same thing, right? Ownership refers to, to ownership. It refers to who actually owns the and you know interest in the company. Profit sharing is simply uh, a, a percentage of the net revenues. And frankly, those aren't mutually exclusive either. You, 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 you could and you probably should negotiate both. Mm-hmm. Right, right. And that's, again, that's if the owner is interested in transfer of ownership upon retirement, right? I wouldn't be bringing, the, if she had said, oh, the owner is like 30, right? There's no way in hell I'd be bringing this up <laughs> right. because ab there's absolutely no 30-year-old in their right mind who, if they believe in their company, who would ever be interested in doing something like this. Anyone who does, um, I would be very suspicious oh, that I they disagree. don't actually believe really I, I do disagree with that when you see some of these fintech founders and i've been lucky to be able to interview a lot of these fintech founders their goal when they create the company is build to sell right yeah it's build it to is, sell it's not build to transfer to uh for, for like a zero money to their employees it's built to sell to have a big exit yeah, but it's not going to be, Paula, it won't be a $0 transfer to this. And if Mary thinks it's going to be a $0 transfer to her husband, she is sadly mistaken. There will be a buy-sell agreement in place where you're going to help this person exit by buying the company from them. Now, you can use company assets to do that. But it still, Paula, is a is a build to sell. This would could still be at thirty thirty five a build to sell scenario. If you've mm -hmm. got a founder who's thirty years old who's like, you know what, in the next five years, Paula, I'm thirty years old. I want to transfer this to you by the time I'm thirty five. Let's build it together, and then you own it long term, and I don't. Yeah, that it that can, makes it, that makes it, zero it, sense. It can still happen. It doesn't make zero sense to me. I've I've. Uh, yeah, I mean, if I can sell it to somebody else, I mean, and if go you do can something else. If you can sell it, if you can sell it, sure. But I mean, a person who's completely unqualified to buy, who doesn't have the assets, who does, you know, it's not going to be a big exit. I would be incredibly suspicious of any. How, how do I know that her, her husband isn't qualified to buy? We don't know what he does at this corporate job. Right. I mean, we, but... we, we don't know if he's the dude that could run the company next and the owner is tired and doesn't want to see it through to the next, the next, uh, you know, right, but if, but if if he doesn't have the underlying assets to make a big purchase, right? Nobody wants to to use their own company as collateral for the sale. Mary's Mary's yelling at her device right now. You guys are off on a tangent. <laughs> Mary, to get back to your question, the big takeaway is stop thinking about stop stop being brainwashed into thinking about salary. Because that's what small thinkers do. Uh, strong words. Very strong words. But that is what I believe. If you're thinking about salary, you're thinking small. Better to work for a buck a month or a buck a year and uh, capture, the, capture the profits, capture the upside. And to be for everybody else who's listening, to be clear, what I'm talking about when I say that is, um, well... Very specifically, when it comes to small businesses, you know, if you're if you're working for a Fortune 500 company, um, as a rank and file employee, any payout that you get is going to be heavily diluted, right? Uh, but if you're working for a small business, the whole point of being in a small business is to be able to participate in the upside. A big Fortune 500 company can give you, they have economies of scale, so they can give you a, a break room with a foosball table, all right? And they can give you uh, on-site dry cleaning and uh, a company holiday party and all of these things that a small business can't. But uh, you, you trade that away when you move to a small company so that you can be in a setting with more flexibility, with more autonomy, and with more upward potential. So essentially, you're trading away a salary lifestyle for really an entrepreneurial lifestyle. No entrepreneur is ever thinking about salary, ever. I had a mentor tell me once that there's two doors in life. There's the security door and the opportunity door and the person who reaches for the security door gets neither. That's good. I might tweet that or X.com that or whatever it's called these days. As long as you quote me. 
All right. Done. Done and done. Two doors in life. All right. Being tweeted as we speak. So thank you, Mary, for the question. And best of luck with what I hope is this transition to the small business. So, Joe, we're laboring on Labor Day, but this episode isn't even going to air until the last week of September. What? It's like we're time yeah. travelers. We're traveling we're time traveling into the future. Exactly. You know, because that, because that's how good of laborers we are. We work a month in advance. We <gasps> we work on holidays a month in advance. How is the future out there, everybody? Yeah. How is it? Is it good? How... <laughs> Do they still have French fries in the future, Paula, do you think? They, they better. They oh, darn well better. They don't. I don't want anything to do with September 27th. <laughs> Our final question today comes from an anonymous caller. Paula, you don't yes. say. I do say. Well, I okay then. I do say. And since we give every anonymous caller a name, well, when I was answering Mary's question, I told her about uh, Jamie Dimon, the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase. Uh, I, I told her about his philosophy about salary, which is, you know, don't worry about your salary, worry about what you're going to learn. You know who else says this? Actually, Robert Kiyosaki in the book Rich Dad, Poor Dad also says the same thing. Don't worry about your salary, worry about what you're going to learn. Um, it's good, I think, advice for life especially for people who are at the beginning of their careers or who are about to change careers or who are thinking about going back to grad school but they don't want uh, to bear the opportunity cost of missing out on having a salary for a couple of years. It's not about one or two years. Where, you know, it's not about that. It's about what you're going to learn. It's about your upward potential. It's about – anyway, point is, in honor of that idea and in honor of some of the people who have – uh, given a voice to that idea, let's name this caller Jamie. I thought we should have named him Homer Simpson because I'm sure Homer Simpson must have said it. Oh, huh. Well, Homer Simpson is the master of side hustles and the master of having fun at that muddled middle, which goes to Christina's question. You know what? Let's do that. Oh, we're, we're bringing in a relief pitcher. Yes, let's name him Homer. Let's let's merge the two together. This is Jamie Homer. Jomer. Jomer, Jomer, Jomer. This is Jomer. Hi, Paula and Joe. My wife, toddler daughter, and I will be moving in about a year, and we're trying to decide on the best option for buying our next home. My wife and I are both 35. Our combined income at the time of the move will be roughly 150000 increasing yearly to 190000 then 220000 and remain generally steady after that. We currently have about $350,000 in retirement accounts, $300,000 in mutual funds and savings, and one long-term rental property. This generates about $2,400 yearly in revenue above paying its mortgage and has about $275,000 in equity. We own the house that we're currently living in, which we would like to turn into a rental also when we move. If we do that, it will generate about $2,400 yearly in revenue above paying the mortgage also, and it currently has about $180,000 in equity. Ideally, we'd like to make this next move our last move for a long time, and we'll need to spend around $600,000 on the next house. To generate the down payment for that home loan, should we sell one or both homes or sell some investments? If so, how much would you recommend planning on using for the down payment? Or is there another option that we haven't thought of? Thanks. Jomer, thank you for the question. <laughs> what? what? His name is Jomer. I'm sorry. <laughs> jo jo Jomer, thank you for the question. Uh, first of all, congrats on everything that you've built, on the uh, increasing salaries, on the fact that you've... Uh, got one and soon to have two rental properties under your belt. Big congrats on all of that, as well as on the clarity of your plan. That was one thing that really struck me as I heard you talk. 
Um, not only have you set things up well, but you have a very clear idea of exactly where you want to go next, exactly when you want to get there, how much that will cost, and what trade-offs might need to be um, made in order to facilitate that. So let's talk about how to put together the funds for this $600,000 home that you want to purchase, your, your forever home. A couple of things strike me right away. Now, you mentioned that uh, your rental, one of your rentals gets $2,400 a year, so $200 a month. Above the mortgage payment, that instantly set off like ding, ding, ding alarm bells. Sometimes people use the phrase mortgage payment colloquially when they, what they actually mean is mortgage payment plus all of their operating costs. I'm hoping that's what you meant, but I, I, if what you meant was literally the mortgage payment is X and the gross monthly rent is X plus 200 per month, right? That is a concern because that two hundred dollars per month does, is not going to equate to actual profit. You're Once probably you underwater. Factor, yeah, exactly, exactly. Once you factor for vacancies, once you factor for repairs, maintenance, m- major capital expenditures, once you factor for all of that, that two hundred is going to be over a long term aggregate average. It's going to be gobbled up. Now there will be minor variation. There might be a, a small run of a few months, maybe if you're lucky. Might there might even be a, a run of a year or two or three when you're up, right? But over the long term, that two hundred a month is not profit. So, so my question back to you is: is when you said that this property makes two hundred a month or twenty four hundred dollars a year above the mortgage payment? Should I take your words at face value? Did you literally mean the mortgage payment, or did you mean above expenses? Uh, that's going to be the differentiating factor. If you literally meant, if I, if I take your words at face value and you literally meant the mortgage payment, that's big red flag there. But if it's 200 a month above expenses, in, including an estimate for long-term vacancy, CapEx, repairs, etc., cool. Then we're good. Then that's a great return, actually, and you should keep it. What was the other one that hit you right away? So the other thing is he talked about how much equity he had in the homes and and then he talked about the uh, cash flow that the homes were creating. But without knowing the value of the homes, I don't know what the cap rate on those homes uh, is. And so, Jomer, what I would uh, suggest to you is you calculate the cap rate and the way that you do that is net operating income divided by the price that you paid for the home equals, uh, and it's, it's going to give you something that is expressed as a decimal point. So then multiply that decimal point by 100. That becomes a percentage, right? That is the percent that represents your cap rate, right? So net operating income, which is the money that's left over after you pay all of your operating expenses, but, but not your financing expenses, right? So leave your Leave the principal and interest portion of the mortgage out of the equation and take your gross rent, subtract out property taxes, homeowner's insurance, repairs, maintenance, vacancies, uh, subtract out all of that. Do not subtract out the principal and interest portion of the mortgage, right? Don't, don't, that doesn't enter into the equation at all, right? But subtract out the non-financing operating expenses from the gross rent, that, come, that will leave you with a figure that's known as your net operating income. Take that net operating income, divide it by the value of the property, and then that becomes the decimal point, which multiplied by 100 becomes a percent. That percentage is your cap rate. If that cap rate is three or under, then I would say definitely get rid of it. If it's four or five, you're in a gray zone. If you like the property and it's easy to manage and relatively new and, you know, and you like, if you like holding it, I don't have any objection to keeping that. Um, If it's above five, that's, that's actually probably pretty good. But yeah, if that cap rate, especially if that cap rate's like 1%, 2%, you know, you're not going to want that. Yeah, that leads to... uh, 
right into what my initial thought, which is, uh, Paula, that we don't have enough information uh, to make that decision, which you already illustrated. We, we do need more info. But I think that the way that I think about this stuff is this, is if, if our goal is to um, look not at which asset we sell, but which asset we keep, I think that is, that's it. Because I want to start with what's in the right place. If something's not in the right place, then I want to prune that bush. I want to make sure that I've got, I've got uh, only assets that are working for me. So your methodology works toward that. Even on just a more basic level, I think for a lot of the people hanging out with us, is, is this. A collection of assets will generally have a lower standard deviation than one asset. What do I mean by that? I mean that standard deviation is the wiggle that you're going to have. So if I've got a collection of, you know, mutual funds that are well diversified, I'll bet the standard deviation on that, the chance that something's going to go wrong on that is a lot less than on a single property. So if my goal is to increase standard deviation, then keeping a single asset is a better idea. If my goal is to lower standard deviation, then keeping the diversified collection is a better idea. So that f for me, that's the first question that, that I would ask. Do I want to try to hit a home run with a single property? Are there things that, let's say that, let's say things don't work out or aren't working out uh, according to the formula that you just laid out. Is there a way to change that formula? If there's a way to change that formula so it's in my favor and I want that higher standard deviation, then I'm going to sell off these mutual funds and I'm going to go with the single property that meets Paula's formula. If, mm. if, if, uh, if I can't, then actually it's pretty, pretty obvious I'm going to sell the property. So mm. th that's the basic framework that I, I use. Am I trying to get there more reliably or am I trying to shoot the moon? Mm. You know, if Joe Murphy, you do want to hold the property uh, because you have so much equity in the properties, you could um, borrow against the equity. Now, I would not do that with a cash out refinance because a cash out refi will close the existing mortgages that you already have and you have a locked in fixed interest rate. You likely do. But what I would do is take out a home equity line of credit or a home equity loan, something that will not close out the original mortgage, but rather separate will simply yeah, open a second separate loan against that equity. And then that would be another way that you could keep the properties and keep the rental income while also um, coming up with the cash for the next down payment. And yes, the home equity line of credit or you know, or the home equity loan will have a fairly high interest rate. But that's true of basically any loan that you're going to take out right now. Every, we're in a high interest rate environment. And so the, the idea right now is uh, marry the property, date the rate, right? When you buy a house, you are marrying the property. This is the house that you want to be in for the long term. Uh, but you're dating the rate. This is just a temporary thing uh and this rate you know you're going to kick this rate to the curb in about a year or two when uh you get a better offer taking out a loan against the equity that you have in both homes that would be another way for you to generate down payment funds without having to get rid of these assets that you already hold because the thing about real estate transactions is um Transacting is very costly, right? Every time that you buy or sell a home, there are substantial buy and sell related fees. And if you think about that, if you compare that to a mutual fund, I mean, Joe, as you know, as a former financial planner, if somebody bought a mutual fund that had some crazy back end load, uh, people would be having a meltdown about it, right? Uh, but every home that you buy basically has it is a like a mutual fund with a giant back end load it's a right there's a, back end load. <laughs> yeah exactly uh there's a huge cost associated with selling the property and so all else being equal broadly speaking the less that you can transact real estate the better people often ask me paula are you buying and selling properties i'm like no i'm just buying i'm not selling i never sell any of my properties 
because why would I take that kind of a hit if instead I could just hold the property and if I ever want to tap that money, I can, I can borrow against it. Um, I'm not going to take the hit to sell unless there's a very compelling reason to do so. So for you, Jomer, um, compelling reason to do so would be if your cap rate is absolute garbage, if you run the numbers and you've got a 1% cap rate, and then you say, wait a minute, can I improve this? Can I increase the gross revenue? Can I decrease the operating expenses, right? You, the, you try to create efficiencies around that property in order to improve the cap rate. But if that fails and your cap rate is still garbage, And if the property is literally bringing in 200 a month above just the mortgage, meaning that you are, you know, over the long term underwater on it, uh, or it's cash flow negative, it's, you're not underwater equity wise, but in the long term, it's going to be cash flow negative because of the tight relationship between gross revenue and uh, monthly mortgage payment. I mean, if that's the case, then yeah, that w- those would be compelling reasons to get rid of it. Anything beyond that, though, hold the property, borrow against the equity. So thank you, Jomer, for your question. And enjoy trading up to the next property. I just realized it could have been Jomer or Jammer. If we went with Jamie, like, yeah, and then the mer. It could have been Jammer. Mer. But we went with Jomer. Mm. I kind of like Jomer because there's Joe in there. So that's probably It could have been homie. (laughs) <laughs> could have been homie. Could have been homie. What a missed opportunity. I would love it if somebody like got in the car with a person listening and you're like, so homie. Wow, these people are very colloquial. Very friendly. Yes. Yeah. Hanging out with our homie.